Folks, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I want to encourage you, fear God. Above everything else, fear God. The title of my sermon this morning is, What Just Happened? And um, the picture I want you to get in, in your mind is, have you seen a person that was walking along so nicely and the next minute they slipped and fell and they look, they have that look on their face like, what just happened, you know? What just happened? So we've been looking at the pattern of the tabernacle to see can we find pointers in the shadow of the Old Testament that could help us press into the glory. And I've been so excited. Man, the sermons have just been uh, somehow getting better and better and more anointed. And I've been feeling so excited to bring them. And I could feel we were getting somewhere. We're going somewhere with this thing. I could sense the presence of the Lord was building in our meetings. And even the attendance was building. And the next minute, I have to close the church because we had at least 20 confirmed cases of COVID. Um, that's besides the many other people who were sick and never got tested, myself included. I was also sick, Rona was sick, but uh, we never had a test. And um, so probably... I want to tell you I had COVID. And I say, Lord, what just happened? So I asked God, what just happened? Hence the title of my sermon today. And like a flash, like in an instant, I said, God, what happened? The church is going so great and the next minute we get such a smack. Like, uh, I mean, things were just starting to happen. We're starting two new ministries. The youth ministry was starting up again. And authentic manhood is starting. And everything is closed. Everything is cancelled. And I'm lying at home feeling sorry for myself. Like a flash, God spoke to me. And he led me to the story of where he wanted to kill Moses. So can we look at that story briefly this morning? Exodus chapter 4 verse 19. And Jehovah said unto Moses in Midian, Go return into Egypt, for all the men are dead that sought thy life. And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass. And he returned to the land of Egypt. Moses took the rod of God in his hand. <clears throat> Folks, Moses had previous encounters with God. Where he saw the burning bush and he argued with God. He said, I can't speak, I can't do this. But here we're reading in Exodus 4.19 that God speaks to Moses and he says, those guys that wanted to kill you back in Egypt, they did. And now I want you to go back. And Moses doesn't hum and haw. He doesn't argue. He doesn't have a lot to say. No argument this time. He just does as God says. You'd think Moses is getting it right. For the first time in his life, maybe he's getting it right. We continue in Exodus 4.24. And it came to pass... On the way at the lodging place that Jehovah met him. And um, in my Bible it doesn't say this, but I like to add it into my notes in brackets. Uh, and Jehovah met him. Met who? Moses. Okay, so we know who we're dealing with here. And sought to kill him. Wow. Really? Moses is obeying, he's doing everything God told him to do. Now go back to Egypt. And now God seeks to kill him. Go figure. 
Then Moses' wife Zipporah took a flint and cut off the foreskins of her sons and cast it at his feet. And she said, Surely a bridegroom of blood art thou to me. So he, in brackets again, God let him, in brackets, Moses, alone. So God is busy trying to kill Moses. And then Moses' wife circumcises the sons. And then God lets him alone. Then she said, a bridegroom of blood art thou because of the circumcision. So folks, today I want to trust God to help us look a little bit at circumcision. God knows when you start to obey his voice, when you doing what Moses did, God gave an instruction and he did it. God knows, better than we know, better than anybody else knows, that it's actually a very dangerous time. Why? Because God is going to show up. He's going to show up in power. He's going to show up in glory. He's going to show up in fire. And He's going to show up in holiness. It's a dangerous time, folks. Uh, you would think that would be the time that the blessing of God would be upon Moses. And there would be no fear of God killing him. No, as he was being obedient, things got dangerous for Moses because God is about to show up. And God is not your playmate and he's not my playmate. God is awesome. He's great. He's mighty. He's much bigger than we realized. So, folks... The priest could not just come in and out of the holies of holies. And uh, you all know that story of the rope around the priest's leg. It's not in the Bible. It's a myth. Where did it come from? I don't know. But it's a good story, okay? That they tied the rope around the priest's leg so that if he died in the presence of God, they could just pull him out. And, and it's a story that can help us understand that if you're going into the presence of God, you better be careful. So even though it's not in the Bible, we can still use it if we like. And I felt God was saying to me, Nick, you're leading your people to levels of glory you have not yet experienced. But if you come into my presence uncircumcised, it will not end well. I'm telling you, we've just had a warning from God. And, and, and the church got a, a smack, so to speak, a, a wake-up call. It will not end well for you or for me if we have the glory of God show up in this church and we come into His presence uncircumcised. It was like God put the brakes on. A, a big warning sign in the Spirit. Proceed with caution. Proceed with caution. Because somebody can get hurt. There is danger ahead. Folks, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I want to encourage you. Fear God. Above everything else, fear God. I, I want to actually make a statement at this time. I will seek the Lord until we see His glory in this church, no matter what. No matter what. That is my declaration that I make before you, that in this church we will see the glory of God. We're going to press into it. But at the same time, it comes with a warning. You know, some medications can have a warning on it. Be careful of this or that. Or, or some street signs can have a warning. And today I want to put up a sign in the Spirit that is a warning that says, do not approach the glory of God without having been circumcised in your flesh. I'm desperate for the glory of God. It, it changes the city, folks. It can change a nation. It can have wave effects that go right around the earth. God is bigger than you think He is. 
He's bigger than your situation. He's bigger than my situations. And I invite the key church this morning, I invite every one of you people on this journey with me, a journey into the glory, into the throne room of God. But it is with a warning that if your flesh is not circumcised, you walking into great danger. So today, in obedience with the word, I want to circumcise my own flesh before God. Because God is holy, holy, holy. And if you want to press into his presence, you better let him do a work of holiness in your heart. I better let him do a work of holiness in my heart. We better make right with God. 1 Peter 1.15 says, But like as he who called you is holy, be ye yourselves also holy in all manner of living. This is godly advice. This is good advice. Folks, he's holy, so you also need to be holy. I also need to be holy. Because it's written, Ye shall be holy, for I am holy. So that is saying in plain English, you need to be holy because God is holy. And, and you know, folks, uh, as, as a pastor, I see things, I hear things, and sometimes God even shows me some things that's going on in the church. But more than all of that, People come into my office and they confess their sins. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I've got so little hair. When <coughs> I'm so grateful to God that I'm not a Catholic priest that they put me in a box and I've got to listen to your confessions. Um, I couldn't handle a whole day of confessions. I can maybe handle 10 minutes and then I've had enough. And so I want to charge you today. Take stock of your life. The negative words that we speak. Come on, folks. God is holy. And then we talk a whole lot of tripe. We talk as if God is not big enough to help our situation. But you see, Pastor, you must understand, my problem is much bigger than God. Well, get a life, folks. If you're going to come into God's presence with that attitude, we better be tying ropes around your leg. Because the glory of God is going to come in this place. The fear of God is going to come in this place. You better believe that God is bigger than your rubbish. You better believe that God is bigger than your sin. You better believe that God is bigger than your problem. And the lies that people tell... I want to tell you, it's not safe to lie to spiritual authority. Often when people tell me lies, I just get a little red light in the spirit. The Holy Spirit says to me, no lichle lekker. <laughs> Ask Peter what happens to people that lie. Folks, we're talking about circumcision of the flesh. But if you want to go into the Holy of Holies, your flesh needs to be circumcised. A lack of submission. You know, sometimes I can speak to people's sickness in their body and I can say, get out in Jesus' name. And the sickness talks to me and it says, man, they don't even listen to you. Why should I? You know? If you happy in the outer court. If you're happy not to be in submission to what the pastor's speaking over your life, then stay there, you're safe there. Can I tell you, a lot of churches, the devil doesn't even worry with them. Because he knows they're so dead, they're not about to wake up anytime soon. But the minute a church wants to press into God, you're going to get attention, folks. 
The devil is going to be looking out for you. But as for this church, as for the key church, we are pushing through the courts of the Lord. And you know how to get into the court of the Lord? You have to come through the gate. There's a gate. Why do you put a gate? To regulate access. And the way you get through the gate is with praise. And what you do in the court is thanksgiving. It's all part of the process of stepping into the very glory of God until you reach the holies of holies. And I want to declare this morning, this church, uh, we can give it different names. We can say, Lord, we're trusting you for revival and we're trusting you for renewal and uh, many things that we can call it. But this morning I want to call it touching the glory. Because if you touch the glory, folks, then something happens. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17. Wherefore come ye out from among them and be ye separate. In other words, be different to the world. The church is so the same as the world that the people can't even see or know the difference. And touch not, uh, and touch no unclean thing. And then the people sit in my office and they tell me the, all the unclean things they do. And I say, Jesus have mercy. If the glory shows up in this place, there's going to be some dead bodies. I'm telling you. We, we're playing with dangerous stuff here, is what I'm telling you. And, and so does that make me want to back off? No, it makes me more determined than ever. I want to touch the glory. I want to touch the glory. But... The challenge that the Holy Spirit is putting on me. Nick, you better circumcise their flesh because otherwise I'll kill you. Because I dare you do what Moses did. Want to take your sons and not circumcise them. It's tough to circumcise your sons. It's easier to just, Moses, just leave the boys. They are right. They won't enjoy circumcision. It's painful. So just leave them. They'll be okay. But God wanted to kill him. And God will kill me too if I will try and lead you into the glory and I haven't yet circumcised you. Touch no unclean thing. And it goes on to say, and I will receive you. Who wants to be received by God this morning? I do. I want to be received by him. And will be to you a father. Who wants a father? You know, we can all have fathers. And some of our fathers were better than other fathers. And some were worse. But Father God, He will never disappoint you. He's a wonderful father. And you will be to me sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Man, that's what I want. I want us to be sons and daughters to the Most High God. You see, circumcising sons, is the, it, it's about the importance of a multi-generational blessing. Let me say that again. Circumcision is about the importance of a multi-generational blessing. So you can serve the Lord wonderfully. And your children can go sweetly off to hell. I'm telling you, we have to circumcise them. We have to challenge them. And, our, and Moses, great man of God that he was, he missed this. You know, when I'm in Israel, I love to go to the Druze community. They make the most wonderful fresh breads. When you walk into the restaurant, they count how many people are coming in, and there's a lady behind the counter there. She's busy making bread, and you're going to get a fresh bread. No, no. It's not a bread like you might know it. It's a flat bread, and each person gets a bread at least this big. It's huge. It's huge. They have a big like copper dome, and it's almost like they would throw a pizza they stretch it out until it's thin like that, and they throw it on the dome. 
and then whatever you order for lunch is coming wrapped in that bread. And I love the Druze people. But the Druze people are not descendants of Moses. They are descendants of Jethro. You can go around Israel asking who are the descendants of Moses. You'd think such a great man would have left a legacy. There's no descendants of Moses in Israel that's known of or heard of. Even Moses' father-in-law left a legacy. And you have this whole group of people that call themselves Druze and they'll tell you they come from the people of Jethro. Moses, one of the greatest men of God, but the generation stops with him because he didn't circumcise his sons. At least he had a spiritual son in Joshua. But what happened to Moses' actual sons? Aaron's sons followed in their father's footsteps and became uh, high priests and, and all sorts of wonderful things. What happened to Moses' sons? I'm telling you, there's many teachers, but there's not many fathers. A true father will circumcise his sons. He will <coughs> challenge them. God, help me this morning to challenge my sons and daughters to search their heart. And look if there be anything that's not pleasing to him. Because it's got to come out at the roots, folks. And I want to tell you that it's time for us to look at legacy. What is the legacy that you leave behind? You know, um, my grandparents were great uh, uh, men and women of God in this city. And they did great exploits and their children, some of them went on to do great exploits in the earth for Jesus. But that generation is passing. It's time for the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. Where is the legacy of Basil and Kathy Crompton People that lived, that sowed their whole life for Jesus. I want to see the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren rise into that legacy and go beyond where they went and do great exploits for God. And you need to get that for your family. Believe God. And in all of that, do not trample the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10.26, for if we sin willfully, if you willfully sin, you know that you're not supposed to do it, but you're going to do it anyway because you like to do it. That's called willful sinning. After that we've received the knowledge of truth, you know the truth, you know better, but you're going to go and do that sin anyway, and then you're going to come here, and we're going to press into the glory, I'm telling you there's going to be ructions. There's going to be earthquakes in the spiritual realm. You cannot willfully continue in your sin, willfully continue doing wrong, knowing what's right, choosing to do wrong, because it feeds your flesh. That means you have not been circumcised. You have not been brought to account. Say, cut that out, putty, or otherwise we cut you off. Get out of this church because you cannot bring that spirit in you. Hebrews goes on to say, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fierceness of fire which will devour the adversary. Folks, this is sobering stuff. That we better get our lives right. Those little sins that we happily carrying along with us, you cannot take them where God is taking this church. They have no place here. We've got to make up our mind, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. 
And God, you're big enough to break through into my circumstance. My circumstance is not bigger than my God. And you've got to get that mindset in you. And stop with the milly mouth. Oh, my problem is so big, not even God has a snowball's hope of fixing it. That's just ugly, stinking thinking. Folks, the Torah portion for this week is from Leviticus 1 verse 1. And Jehovah called unto Moses. So all around the world, the Jewish people are starting the book of Leviticus, chapter 1, verse 1, and it starts off with saying, God called unto Moses. What is so important, you want to ask yourself? Uh, because God often spoke to Moses, and God met with Moses, and, but now this is something different. This is the book of Leviticus. This is a, a, a book about blood sacrifice predominantly. And so God starts this book off by saying, and Jehovah called unto Moses. Obviously God had something very important to share with Moses. And I'm going to tell you what he had to share. The way to draw near. God was saying, Moses, I want you and the Israelites to draw near to me. But there's a way to do it. And the way to do it is by the atoning sacrifice. It's speaking about the blood. We're going to get to communion in a few minutes. But God is saying, there's a way to draw near. Moses, I'm calling you out now. I'm calling you to come and hear. We're going into the book of Leviticus. There's a way to draw near to God. I want you to draw near to me. But the way is you come through the blood, the atoning sacrifice. <clears throat> what does atoning mean? To pay the full price. There's a price that has to be paid for sin, folks. You cannot come here and worship God and raise your hands and the price has not been paid. You're living dangerously. The sinner who approaches God, trusting in the efficacy of the sacrifice, will find healing. Now I'm using big words, but I will explain that word. E uh, efficacy is the ability to produce the desired result. So, for instance, you can get one pill, which is very good for maybe a headache, let's say Panado. And, and so, the doctor will say the efficacy of that pill for that problem is very good. But if you have some other problem like maybe a snotty nose or whatever, the pill's not going to work. You've got to find out either this thing works for that situation or it doesn't. Efficacy, the ability to produce the desired result. Now I want to tell you that the way to God is through the blood. But if it's not working... If you're still living in your sin, if there's no change, then the efficacy of it, uh, there's a problem. And I want to tell you the problem is not with the blood. The blood will never lose its power. But has the blood been properly applied? Romans 3 verse 25. Whom God set forth to be a propitiation. Big word again. And that's from the Hebrew word karopet, okay? Uh, and the scripture in Romans 3.25 goes on to say, through faith, through faith. You see, that's how you apply the blood. So people think, oh, um, I've had communion. I, no, no. You can drink communion. I can buy you liters of this juice. It's not going to help you. 
I can buy you 10 liters of this juice. You can drink it until you explode. It's through faith. And if you apply it with disbelief, the efficacy will not be there. It will not work. The problem is not with the blood. The problem is with it hasn't been correctly applied. And so if you are struggling in sin, if you're not getting victory over these things, it's because you have not applied it in faith. Because when faith comes and you start to see how big is God and how amazing is the blood, you won't want to continue in your sins. Another translation for propitiation is the mercy seat. The mercy seat. Some Bibles will translate it as the mercy seat. Folks, there's mercy for you and for I. There is propitiation for you and for I. But you have to come to it through faith. There's no other way. You can't take this lightly. If you take this communion lightly, if you think you can come in here and you can shout glory, hallelujah, and you can raise your hand, but your faith is in your boots, the blood has not been properly applied. The very first step, because remember folks, I've been teaching you about the pattern. How do you get into the glory of God? So we go to the Old Testament, we look at the shadow we look at the tabernacle, the beauty of the tabernacle. The very first step is the blood sacrifice. You, as you come in to the doorway, the first thing you're going to meet is the blood sacrifice where the animals were offered on the altar. And if you think you can serve God and bypass that, then you lost the plot. And the blood must be carried from the very first item of furniture in the tabernacle. This is part of the pattern of how God wants us to come into His glory. The priest would take that blood and he would carry it past all those other items of furniture into the Holy of Holies. You cannot approach the Holy of Holies. You cannot get into the glory of God without bringing <coughs> the blood with you. And folks, that is the danger when our flesh is uncircumcised. We're doing things that we know we shouldn't be doing. We're living for the devil and you think you're going to go into the Holy of Holies, into the glory when the worship team is bringing the glory down and you in the glory and you're raising your hands but you know you're going home to go and sin this afternoon and you don't care. You're in danger. You're in the danger zone. Folks, that blood needs to be sprinkled on the mercy seat. It needs to be sprinkled on that propitiation for you and for I. The blood is the first thing. It's central to the whole thing. It's the most important. So propitiation only works through faith. And if you're sitting here and think, uh, God can't change my situation because it's so bad, it's so big, I'm so addicted, I'm so this, I'm so that, there's no hope for me, that is not faith and you have not applied the blood. And then you wonder why the blood doesn't work. It will not work without faith. <clears throat> And it's not working in your life and then you blame God. It's not God, it's you. Your flesh needs to be circumcised. You need to humble yourself before God. Let the fear of God get on you, man. Let the fear of God come on me. If I have one failing, it's probably that I don't circumcise people's flesh enough. Rona often tells me, don't be a wimp, man. Just tell them. Just tell them. 
Ah, I feel sorry for them, you know. Shame. She says, don't be a wimp, Nick. Don't be a wimp. Just tell them the truth. God, help me. God, help me to circumcise my sons and daughters. People that are going to go to a lost eternity. People that are going to burn in hell forever because they weren't challenged with the fear of God, with the holiness of God, with the righteousness of God. And then I want to take you with me, sweetly, sweetly. Come with me. Let's go into the Holy of Holies. You better have a rope around your leg because you're coming out there stone dead. If you never changed, it never worked. And let's not blame the blood. Let's blame the plying of the blood. The taking it in faith. In other words, you have to appropriate. You have to take that offering for yourself. You have to believe God. If you're living in this fog of, oh, life is difficult, I don't think I'm going to make it. I, I don't know if I can overcome the sin. I don't know if my family can ever come right again, there's too many problems. You're living in a fog, man. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Start to believe what your pastor says. When I tell you there's hope for your family, when I tell you there's hope for you, when I tell you that you can be an overcomer, when I tell you you can overcome sin and you don't have to live in defeat, it's not God's plan for you, but it's where you're living and God doesn't want you living there and don't dare try and enter His glory in that mindset. It's dangerous. There's big warning signs. You're going to get a club. And I wish it was from me because my clubs are not that bad. And after today, I don't want anybody to say, Pastor never warned us. I like to preach glory, hallelujah sermons. But today I felt there's a warning in the spirit. I'll not be true to myself or to God if I don't share that warning with you, that God wants to do something. Man, for years I've longed for revival. For years I've longed, I've prayed, I've pressed into. And I'm telling you, we're going to see it, folks. We're going to see the glory of God. And lives are going to be changed. But if your problem is bigger than God, then you the problem. You the problem. It, it's, there's a song that goes, Lord, it's me that's in the need of prayer. It's not my brother or my sister. I, I forget how the song goes, but it's a lovely old song. It's me. Stop blaming everybody around you. If you will live for God, Breakthrough is your portion. If you will live for God. But pastor, I can't live for God because my problems are too big. Yes, because you believe, you got more faith in your freaking problems than you got in the King of Kings. You got more faith in unbelief than in what Jesus is able to do. If we start to renew our minds, if my God becomes bigger than my problem. If, if I start to uh, speak the truth that God is good all the time, that I'm an overcomer, I'm not under the problem, I'm living above the problems because I'm soaring. It doesn't mean you won't have problems. It means that you soar in prayer above the problems. You get into your closet and you seek God and you touch heaven and then you get perspective. Perspective is very important. Something can look very big until you're standing above it. And then you see, okay, it's not as big as I thought it is. A mountain can look very tall until you've climbed to the top and you look down and you just see the beauty 
of the scenery beneath you. I want somebody under the sound of my voice this morning to change your perspective. Say, Pastor, you don't understand. My life is a mess. I've lived so many years for the devil and it's hard to break out of that. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. Your whole life can be turned around. You can go from being a devil to a deacon in about 10 minutes. You can go from living for the devil to living for Jesus. And every one of us needs to search our heart because there's things in our life that cause us to stay. Say, so, Pastor, I don't understand. I've been praying for years and nothing has happened. I want to tell you nothing is going to happen because there's things in your life that need to change. When you touch God, everything changes. But God dared and show up in this place because it will expose the sin. It will expose the wrong thinking. And God is gracious. He doesn't want to make us all look like fools. He wants us to come to Him in repentance. He wants us to serve Him. He wants us to apply the blood. Folks, I can't tell you how powerful the blood is. It's the very first, most important thing. When you step into that tabernacle, then they burn the sacrifice on the altar. But the priest takes that bowl of blood and he goes past the table of showbread. He goes past the menorah, which speaks of Jesus. He goes past the uh, golden altar of incense. All of those things, it's necessary to have the blood. And then he goes into the Holy of Holies and he offers on that mercy seat, on that propitiation, he sprinkles the blood. And there's power in the blood to change your life forever. So you haven't been serving God. You've put everything else above God. Get, getting to church is not the most important thing in your life. If you get there, so well done. And if you don't, so what? No, 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 no. Put Jesus first in your life. Let Jesus rule and reign in your life. Have faith in the sacrifice that Jesus gave his blood for you. And I promise you, if you apply the blood in faith, it will change your life. And if your life has not changed, it's because you have not seen God for who he is. You take God lightly. You don't fear God. I tell you, when the fear of God comes on you, you won't want to sin. You won't you won't want to speak rubbish like you speak all the time. You'll want to count your words because you'll know you're in the presence of God. Even right now, the Holy Spirit's in this place. Well, just where you're sitting, bow your heads and close your eyes. <coughs> May the fear of God come upon the people of God that this be a church that will touch heaven and change earth. If you touch heaven, earth will be changed. Right now, let the Holy Spirit circumcise your mind. Yes, I know some of you, oh, you love Jesus, but you still got Huge areas of your mind that are just problems that you can't see the answer to. You can't see the answer to your family. It's unbelief. It's coming against God. It's standing defiant before God. Like a Goliath you are, you ugly thing. Repent. And believe God. Because I promise you, if you touch God, 
everything around you is going to change. Your home is going to change. Your family is going to change. Your children are going to change. I, that's why I'm desperate to touch God. I'm desperate. I'm desperate to touch God. We need God in this evil earth that we live in these evil times. We need a touch of God. But while you're dwelling in your stinking thinking, you come and you partake of communion, not in faith, but in doubt and in fear. And then you say, it never works for me. Well, it never will. The blood has no e efficacy in doubt. The blood has no efficacy in unbelief. The blood is the most powerful thing you ever heard of, far more powerful than atomic bomb. But it doesn't work in doubt. It doesn't work in faith. Its place of operation uh, is faith, folks. It's activated by faith. The thing that switches it on is faith. Say, Pastor, it's not working for me. Change your thinking. Change your thinking. Change your thinking.